Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very good. Okay, perfect. Uh, right, so I'm happy to see all the participants. Also, hello to those who are watching us in the recording. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Katerina Kafka Weber, and together with my husband, Tony Weber, I co founded the TK Lingua Online English School. Since 2019, we've been working with veterinarians and we wanted to give them some more uh, real life speaking experience, mm -hmm. listening to conferences, giving talks in English to just improve their opportunities. And today we are also helping our uh, dear friend and student, Yekaterina Shushpanova, a vet endocrinologist and behavioral uh, special medicine specialist. Today's her first chemotherapy day. So Yekaterina, good luck, we believe in you. And um, please remember that uh, today it's a uh, practice for our speakers, so be nice to them. And if you have any questions, uh, we will be happy to answer them. Uh, please put them in the chat and then the speakers will have time to answer. So uh, the first speaker today is uh, Alexander Gogitidze, who will talk about COVID-19 from a veterinary point of view. So Alexander, uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, did you see my uh, slides now? Yes. Yes, thank you much. Hello, dear colleagues. I am glad to see and hear you again. As you can see, my report is devoted to a modern topic about which they talk and write a lot of today. It's coronavirus infection of, of people uh, or COVID-19. In my opinion, some aspects in this term are not disclosed enough. I mean, uh, origin and evolution of KZT agents this disease. Questions about origin virus and acute respiratory syndrome is directly related to veterinary medicine because knowledge about animal disease is needed to resolve it. According to scientist data, all human coronaviruses have animal origins. Today, most people consider that bat as a source of a human coronavirus infection. Let us try to figure out if this is so. We know that there are four groups of coronavirus, alpha coronavirus, beta coronavirus, gamma coronavirus, and delta coronavirus. Alpha and beta coronavirus usually case respiratory illness in humans, such as SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV, and gastroenteritis in animal, uh, for example, porcine enteritic diarrhea virus, Swine acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus and porcine transmissible gastroenteritis virus. Gamma and delta coronavirus um, usually infect um, birds. Here is a picture uh, that demonstrated uh, the chain of spread of the coronavirus. It's clearly seen here that bats and rats are natural reservoirs for the virus. In order to infect a human, the virus must pass through the intermediate host, who is in contact with people more often than ever. For example, for a human coronavirus uh, 229, the intermediate host is alpaca or vicunia. For whom human coronavirus OC43, cattle, mers cov chemo. With the emergency and identification of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it became known that it's transmitted from bat to humans, but who was the intermediate host is unclear. Uh, since all intermediate animals for human coronavirus were pets, uh, scientists began searching among them. The first suspicion fell on the pound survey which in soft, Southeast Asia is a domestic animal like our cat. The fact is the palms that have, have already been the source of the SARS-CoV-1 infection, but genetic studies regarding SARS-CoV-2 haven't confirmed this. After a long search, scientists turned their attention to its pangolins. Pangolins are not pets, and terrible food must be found for a long time. Separate pathological study for decayed pangolins indicated the frequent detection of lung lesions in these animals. For example, several physiological sections. 
At the top left, you can see healthy patapandolins lung history. Top right and down are the lung of the sick animals. Magnification lung output. In the affected tissue, you can see the proliferation and disclamation of, of the alveolar epithelium and the accumulation in cells of hemocytic pigments. In this state, the lung tissue can't finally function and the animal experiences severe hypoxia. On the right is electron microscope of the affected tissue, where you can see the pathogen itself with characteristic spines on the surface. Let's compare this with the change in a human lungs with this disease. Here you can also see the intensive proliferation of the respiratory epithelium and the disclamation into the lumen of the alveolar and bronchioles. The human patient, like the pangolins, suffocates from the blockage of the alveolar. The study of the genome of the pangolins virus shows that this is closer to SARS-CoV-2 than the bad virus. For comparison, the length, the length of the nucleotide chain of the genome. So SARS-CoV-2, 29,903. Pangolins coronavirus, 29,529. 21, sorry. Bet HP, bet, bet, uh, beta coronavirus, 31,491. The fact is the pangolin skills are in a great demand in the alternative medicine market which leads to many contact between animals and human tissues. Due to the numerous contact between infected pangolin tissue and humans, adaptation of the virus to human tissue has become possible. According to Aditya Vikram, more than 70,000 70, killed pangolins end up on the black market every year. This photo that you can see uh, shows the hundreds uh, dead pangolins, victims of greed, ignorance, and human cruelty. The fact is that pangolin scales have no medical value. Its composition is identical to our nails, just keratin. This photo shows many bags to pangolin scales confiscated from poachers. The number of these animals in the recent year has been reduced to extreme limits. The situation of pangolins today is so catastrophic that we can say COVID-19 is the ravage of a brave little animals to heartless humanity. That's all. Thank you very much, my friends. Alexander, uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions to him? Okay, uh, if not, uh, then we can give the word to our next speaker, uh, Ivan Makarov, who will talk about periodontitis in cats and dogs and how we can diagnose it. So, Ivan, uh, you're welcome. Uh, hi, colleague. So, I can't uh, see the your screen, I mean, from Zoom, because I open my... Mm, ah, yeah, I understand. Watch the problem. One minute. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very glad to do, to present you uh, this presentation, especially if it help, uh, if it helps uh, Yekaterina Shushpanova. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Dr. Ivan Makarov, the head doctor of veterinary clinic Jungle, and I'm a member of uh, European Veterinary Dental Society. Um, I want to present you uh, the topic, periodontitis in dogs and cats, and how we can diagnose it. Um, I choose uh, this topic because uh, Mm, periodontitis is very widespread disease. It's a, <laughs> the most widespread than other disease. 
So that is why I think it's uh, important. Uh, it doesn't matter on which kind of clinic you work and uh, just like a specialist uh, in some area, like a cardiologist and dermatologist and therapist, uh, yes, or uh, just like uh, in general, uh, you uh, like a general practitioner, so you can do all uh, surgery, uh, some kind of surgery and therapy and other. Uh, one minute. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, as we see, so about uh, uh, eighty-five percent dogs and uh, sixty-five per, uh, percent uh, percent of cats over three years old have a periodontitis. Uh, we can uh, distinguish three groups. A puppy, adult, and so uh, all the animals. Uh, sorry, I can. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, all the animals. Uh, the puppy, if puppy have uh, those problems, uh, the, um, it sorry. depends on. Uh, just a moment. Um... Не знаю, к сожалению, не написано имя, а участник с номером телефона 011 и так далее. У вас включен звук, поэтому я выключила звук, чтобы вас не было слышно, и чтобы мы не отвлекались. Пожалуйста, не включайте его. Спасибо. Окей, Иван, извините, вы продолжаете. Да, да, да. Но у них есть проблемы, если у них есть какие-то болезни, как травма, инфекционная болезнь. Uh, some kind of this. So adult animals, uh, they have this uh, disease. If we, uh, if the owner of those animals do not uh, use uh, toothpaste and toothbrush at home, uh, if uh, they don't have uh, uh, oral dental home care. And, uh, and of course, uh, the main group of uh, those animals is uh, all the animals. Uh, in those animals, we can find, and sometimes uh, ninety percent, uh, ninety percent of those group, we can find uh, period periodontitis. Uh, so the reasons is uh, general health condition. If uh, the uh, if animals have uh, internal organs disease, infection disease, etc. Of course, uh, main points is genetic factor, uh, immune state, state, uh, status, saliva composition, uh, water, food, ecology, and age, as I told uh, in previous slide. Uh, uh, periodontitis is a very insidious disease. Uh, it looks like uh, sometimes it looks like uh, just a plaque and calculus, but it's not really uh, like this. Yes, uh, because uh, when animal have periodontitis, the uh, organism is intoxicates. Uh, it influence on the central nervous system, uh, influence on heart, kidneys, liver, and of course it uh, the pain is become and uh, sometime af after ultrasound procedure and uh, when we extract the teeth uh, we can see how animals uh, life became became better uh, uh, animals can eat and can play with toys but at previous time about sometimes uh, three or five times of three or five years, they do not play in toys. But after these procedures, they can do this. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, all of those, it leads to a poor quality of life and, and uh, even death. And we can uh, understand, well, we should understand it. Uh, and of course, uh, that is not, uh, Problem only for periodontitis. We can see it in, in with uh, when uh, when uh, went to us with uh, animals if, uh, if they have just other disease. But the most problem, the biggest problem, is time. 
yes because when they can watch just uh, plug and calculus uh, maybe uh, in early time they do not pay attention on that so um, and they went to us if the, the animals do not eat or show the owner how it too difficult to gum some food etc uh, so in these cases uh, uh, in general we should just extract the teeth remove uh, uh, remove dindiva and uh, some soft tissues of uh, some periodontal tissues uh, how we can uh, how can we indicate periodontitis at home yes uh, if you look at these uh, photos uh, if, uh, we can find uh, several uh, uh, several views of periodontitis just uh, brown teeth so the color have uh, other no, the color of teeth is uh, brown sometimes it became like a black and uh, it depends on which kind of calculus uh, prefer of those organisms and uh, which kind of food uh, ate the animals uh, of course we can find uh, dendivitis and uh, uh, periodontal pockets yes and uh, we can see on the right side of the uh, on, on the photos is recession in scissors recession on uh, uh, on the maxilla oh uh, in uh, have uh, has uh, four stages uh, but uh, they, uh, they have uh, zero stages uh, that is a normal condition animals, yes. The stage one of periodontitis is established uh, dendivitis. Uh, we can find uh, dendiv dendivitis, see the pocket. Uh, and uh, if we do dental x-ray, we do not find any changes uh, in bone. Stage, uh, stage two, that is a mild periodontitis. We can... Uh, find uh, uh, the same at uh, dendivitis, uh, recession of dendiva, pockets, uh, and alveolar crest is 25% lower. Uh, which we can see on dental x-ray. Uh, so if we just, uh, if we do a dental x-ray, we can see how the bone is goes down. So, and till 25%, that is stage number two. The stage number three, uh, that is moderate periodontitis. Uh, we can find advanced, advanced uh, gingivitis, gingivitis, recession of gingiva, teeth mobility, uh, calculus, uh, and uh, horizontal and vertical bone loss, and lower, of course, loss of the alveolar crest. Uh, from 25% till 50% per percent. Stage four, uh, that is a severe, severe periodontitis, uh, general inflammation of oral mucosa we can find uh, at these animals, uh, pass in the mouth, advanced gingivitis, recession of dendiva, teeth mobility, uh, calculus horizontal and ventricular bone lost more than 50%. Uh, in uh, which we can see on dental x-ray. I want to add to this information. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can find which uh, kind of uh, stage only if we do dental x-ray and it depends on the uh, teeth. So uh, in some teeth you can uh, put like a diagnose, you can put uh, or fixed in your list, that is stage number two. In other uh, tooth, you can find a stage number three or four. It depends. <clears throat> but of course, if there's uh, 
small animals, uh, pe if these pets from uh, special breeds, yes, I mean, it's a very small breeds like a Yorkshire Terrier. Uh, in general, especially if those animals uh, older than seven years, we can find stage number four in general. Yes, and this. But uh, we should uh, do dental x-rays. So that is why it's very important because you can find other problem we, which you do not can find just uh, uh, when you look at this patient, when you look at this model. Okay. And periodontal prop is almost important. Uh, and um, you can see uh, the deep, how pocket is deep. Uh, so that's about 10 millimeters. And uh, why is this important uh, if we just do dental x ray? Because uh, I know many clinics who have a dental x-ray and uh, many vets uh, thought if I have dental x-ray, so it's enough to, to do diagnose uh, periodontitis and which kind of stage uh, have these animals. But uh, that is not true because sometimes when you do dental x-ray, uh, the bone just... Uh, mm, if, uh, the bone goes on the uh, on the sensor, and uh, they just cover this is uh, pocket periodontal pocket, and you do not find it on dental X-ray. Just uh, if you have uh, a dental X-ray, yes, uh, this is the same situation when you do a general X-ray. I mean, just a, a big sensor, yes, and all kind of structure all teeth, they fix it on this sensor. And sometimes uh, uh, the same we can see on dental x-ray. So that is why we should uh, add instrumental, uh, uh, instrumental exam uh, for these animals. It's, uh, that is very important. And uh, the same periodontal, periodontal prop, but in uh, the uh, on the teeth one hundred eight. What we can see on this, we can see just a periodont pocket about ten millimeters, and uh, the area where periodontal pocket is led is like uh, under eyes. So that is infraorbital area. That is, that is why sometimes if we don't do anything, we do not treat and we don't, do not extract these teeth. Uh, in the future, in the future, we can see like those cases. Yes. Uh, that is very painful. The infraorbital area uh, became very huge because of, of Pos, uh, which end on tissue, uh, and uh, for those, if you can see on the video, we do not uh, find any problems with uh, teeth two hundred and eight. Look at this. Yeah, but we can distinguish a trauma trauma there yes uh, trauma is led to this inflammation the same uh, for cats uh, it is periodontitis and uh, gingivitis and uh, filling adentoclastic resorption lesions we can find it uh, in gingiva area on other teeth for sure plaque and calculus there. Uh, and uh, of course, I did dental x ray for those animals, but when I look at this, I understand. So, that is about 19, uh, 99% uh, 
we should extract all t uh, in this case. And when we can find, uh, when, when we extract teeth and they look uh, like this one, uh, it show us like we do not, uh, there was uh, in, the, in these animals, there was a very, um, very big inflammation and periodontitis stage four, because we do not, uh, we can't ex just uh, put it uh, just extracted from uh, mouth and that's all, like this one. In uh, normally, when we extracted teeth uh, uh, in cats, uh, we should cut the gingiva, uh, soft tissue of periodontitis. We use bore and high speed unit uh, when we remove uh, uh, bone crest, alveolar bone crest and uh, separate uh, each teeth. It depends on how many uh, roots uh, it has. And after that, we can remove their roots from cats. Uh, so it's very difficult procedure and, uh, and we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, and in this case, of course, we spent about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes only. The same periodontitis in dogs. That is uh, several uh, cases. We can find uh, plaque, calculus, recession, mobility of teeth, and in periodontal pocket, especially in 208, uh, we can find the fur uh, and grass, uh, so, it, of course, it uh, was removed before we extract those teeth. Uh, teeth. And it's uh, very important because some owners uh, ask me about why we should spend money on uh, um, ultrasonic scaling because we, uh, we, remove, or we extracted these teeth. Why we should do this? But that is very important because uh, some plaque or calculus or uh, grass, fur, etc. Uh, it can um, go to not to the wound, and if, of course, when we suture it, this wound, uh, we will see inflammation in this area. So, in human uh, dentistry, if we just do endodontic treatment, of if we just remove uh, um, dentine infection uh, which infection and uh, destruction dentin uh, in these cases uh, before we they they should i mean medical should do ultrasonic scaling because it's very important in this case the same it's very important especially because we do very huge uh, uh, surgery uh, we should spend uh, a lot of time on this and uh, of course uh, that is very Mm -hmm. That is not like a easy, I just remove uh, teeth. That is very, mm, uh, very difficult procedure. And uh, so another, you know, the same, you can see, yeah, calculus and recession. Now the same, now we can find uh, period periodontitis stage four because we can distinguish it. The book goes, uh, alveolar crest goes down and uh, we don't do dental X-ray. Uh, I mean, when we look at this, yes, but uh, without dental X-ray, we understand uh, that is stage number four. And, uh, and on dental X-ray, uh, I want to um, pay uh, attention on uh, dental x-ray, uh, which uh, located in, on the right side, the second of, uh, from, uh, from top. <clears throat> there are a molar one, and in mesial root, we can find uh, uh, how, the, how the bone have um, different structure. It means maybe in next month, it will be, there will be, uh, pathology 
the mandibula became broken. That is like a pathology fracture. Uh, that is why it's very important, especially in uh, decorative breeds, animals, and uh, we should pay attention on this. The same problem with uh, uh, canines of mandibula, because uh, the same uh, on this area, uh, sometimes we can distinguish uh, pathology fracture of mandibula. And, uh, and this dental x-ray, we can indicate uh, resorption, teeth. Yes, we can, we understand there was a periodontitis because uh, the bone goes down in vertical and horizontal area. And we can find uh, several roots uh, because the resorption, uh, filling odontoclastic resorption lesions uh, in general, it's located uh, in Dindiva area. And uh, in next, uh, their teeth became broken in this area and uh, we can find only roots. So that is, doesn't mean we do not, uh, we should not extract these uh, roots. We should do this uh, because in the future it uh, became, uh, it led to inflammation. And uh, sometimes in three or five percent of those, it led to oncology. It can be led for, to oncology. Uh, so that is why it's very important to extract these teeth. And it doesn't matter that is deciduous roots or that is a permanent roots. Uh, I mean, it's uh, roots from permanent tooth and roots from uh, deciduous teeth. Uh, of course, we um, very often um, heard it uh, like, uh, how can he live without any teeth? So that is not a problem because uh, animals, especially cats, they have adopted a uh, digestive tract. So they can just uh, swallow, uh, swallow uh, food and a uh, piece of meat or etc. For them, it's, uh, that is, doesn't matter. They do not have a gastritis or ulcer, etc. Uh, that is why for them, that is not important. That is important for human because we should come about 33 times and then swallow. So if we people do not uh, don't have uh, teeth, that is for some person psychology problem, and uh, for digestive system, the same problem because uh, uh, if we swallow uh, some pieces of food, uh, it can lead to uh, gastritis or ulcer, etc. And uh, after surgery, we should pay attention uh, the warners on they should clean in teeth with a special paste and toothbrush at home. Uh, special treats. I mean, this like a special fits when uh, like a goods, uh, yes, uh, uh, goodies when uh, uh, the, um, the dogs can bite it. And uh, after that, uh, the teeth became cleaner than before. Like a special toys, the same uh, function uh, it has. Uh, special unguent, ointment, and powder. And of course, professional ultrasonic dental cleaning. It depends on how um, faster plaque and uh, calculus uh, fix it on the teeth. Some, for some animals, say you, um, we should do this like a one, once a year for other it's once or on three years. Uh, and of course, if uh, owner cleaning teeth with a special past and toothbrush, uh, they will go to, ultrason to professional ultrasonic dental scanning uh, seldom than, um, than animals or for which do not um, 
uh, than for animals, uh, if their owner do not do cleaning teeth in uh, at home. And of course, especially it, it depends uh, on the periodontitis, on the stage of periodontitis, uh, um, the, or, the owner should go to uh, for dental checkup to veterinary dentistry specialist every three or six months. But if that uh, is okay, then if the animal do not have any problem with teeth, they should go uh, two times a year. So that is very important, especially for animals. Uh, when we show uh, the owner how uh, they should clean the teeth on dent uh, at home, uh, they, uh, in preview they show us how they do that at home, and then we show them how it, uh, it could be done. It... That is Zona. So next, uh, how that should be do this? So it's very important to fix it on the left hand, uh, the head, and uh, fix it uh, the mouth. And then uh, other um, procedure is very easy to do, but it's difficult to fix toothbrush inside the mouth from uh, tongue side and clean from tongue and from uh, palatine uh, on the maxilla. I show. Uh, a little trick for owner and they, they understand it. Uh, and if uh, the animals, <laughs> uh, uh, the animals, сейчас забыл слово, позволит это делать. If animals let you do it. Uh, if animals let you do it. So uh, the dental, clean teeth uh, became done and uh, uh, which led to health uh, breath uh, for, for fresh breath and health teeth uh, so thank you for your attention uh, sorry i'm a little bit nervous at the end and uh, uh, that's all if you have any question please uh, ask me or send me message i will answer you. Ivan, thank you very much. I actually have one question. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you show this procedure, uh, the cats and dogs uh, don't look very happy. <laughs> as <I understand. laughs> They don't like it. But if you clean the teeth every day, do they feel better about the procedure or not? Yes, uh, that is a... Uh, uh, they do not look very happy because uh, that is a some of first time when we try to clean the teeth uh, toothbrush. So that is why for them that is abnormal. Um, I have uh, several videos uh, when for animals that is like a, a habit. Yes, and they can uh, open mouth and do not have a problem or stress from this, uh, but uh, 
I prepare it for special books, uh, for special book, uh, which maybe will be, uh, we will make in next year. And on special QR code, we can show it. You, you can see it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you have a question from Natalia. Uh, is there a tool space for dissolving calculus? Uh, no, uh, that is not correct. Uh, this is for solving from plaque. Uh, for if we can find a calculus, for these cases, uh, only ultrasonic scaling. Uh, uh, that is will be a rightful way. Okay, uh, thank you, Ivan. And Natalia, thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, right, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Lydia Birikova, uh, who will talk about um, managing the bladder in neurological patients. So Lydia, uh, you are free to start. Just, we can't hear you right now. Oh yeah, no, it's fine. So can, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet, okay. I will try again. Yeah, technology can be <laughs> quite challenging sometimes. Yeah, now it's working. Uh, okay, and now... Can you see my screen now? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> yes, I made it. Uh, so, can I stop? Uh, yes, sure, carry on. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Lydia Birukova. I am from uh, Moscow, Russia. I'm working in the veterinary clinic Vadali, and my areas of uh, specialization are uh, cardiology, ultrasound diagnostics, and uh, neurology. Uh, all areas of veterinary medicine are now progressing quite fast, and unfortunately I have not enough time and energy to grow in all the areas as good as I wish to. Neurology is now the last in my list of specialization, and I have very few neurological patients, but sometimes I missed it a lot, and that conference became a good uh, possibility for me to refresh some of my knowledge about the particular theme, uh, the bladder management in neurological patients. I have no, nothing to disclose and no conflict of interests. And first of all, I want to say thank uh, Taka Lingua School for that possibility and my personal news, the Hatfield, uh, the veterinary nurse uh, from the University of Glasgow Animal Hospital. Her report on the ACVIM uh, conference this year about uh, the same topic inspired me a lot. <coughs> In, in addition, uh, I, I uh, thank all of you attendees of uh, that conference for your interest and uh, for your help to our colleague. Well, uh, urinary complications are quite common in dogs and cats with uh, neurological dysfunction. And if not properly managed, uh, they can become even more serious problem uh, than underlying ne neurologic disorder and are associated with increased patient morbidity. Uh, however, uh, they are usually preventable uh, with careful examination and uh, knowledge about managing the dysfunction. Uh, in that uh, lecture, I want to briefly overview the functional neuroanatomy of the urinary bladder and urethra. Um, types of uh, the bladder dysfunction, uh, techniques of the blood the expression and drugs are likely to help in managing the dysfunction. Now, from the beginning, a little about 
difference between micturition and urination. Uh, the micturition is a two-stage uh, process uh, that results in the passage uh, of uh, urine out of the body. Um, and there is a passive component uh, that involves the storage of urine within the urinary bladder and an active component uh, for avoiding uh, the urine from the body. Uh, the urination uh, refers to just a voiding phase. Um, Uh, the urinary bladder is, uh, I can, yeah, can you see my, um, I don't know. Yes, we can see the castle, yes. The castle, yeah. Uh, the urinary bladder is a hollow organ, uh, primarily composed of three layers of smooth muscle, uh, collectively termed the detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle contains both adrenergic and cholinergic uh, receptors that are important in bladder filling and contraction uh, respectively. Uh, beta adrenergic receptors uh, of the bladder are innervated by the hypogastric nerve, uh, which originates uh, from the L1, L4 of spinal cord segments in dogs and L2, L5 uh, segments in the cat. Uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors uh, of the bladder are innervated by the pelvic nerve, uh, which originates uh, from the sacral spinal cord segments. Uh, the smooth muscle of the detrusor extends into the proximal urethra and forms an internal urethral sphincter. Uh, the smooth muscle of the urethra is primarily innervated by the hypogastric nerve uh, through the alpha adrenergic receptors. Uh, the, the distal uh, urethra is composed uh, by the pudendal nerve uh, through the nicotinic cholinergic uh, receptors. Uh, this delineate Lineation is more clear in human anatomy. For dogs and cats, the smooth and striated musculature overlap, making differentiations between internal and external sphincter, sphincters uh, less clear. Uh, here, again, the brief over overview of the important uh, receptors for efferent autonomic innervation of the bladder and ureter. Uh, here you can uh, see the schematic uh, illustration depicting the functional neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of urination. Um, the micturition uh, is an autonomic uh, reflex arc at the level of the spinal cord uh, that, may, that may be facilitated or inhibited by centers in the brain located within the cerebral cortex, uh, cerebellum, uh, pons and the reticular spinal tract. Uh, neuronal population of the, of the brainstem uh, normally coordinates the spinal reflex arcs uh, involved in bladder filling and emptying. Uh, therefore, the brainstem micturition center uh, can be considered as the upper motor neuron uh, for normal urination. Uh, higher cortical centers uh, inhibit the micturition reflex and provide uh, tonic contraction of the external uh, urethral center. This is the basis of house uh, or litter box training. Uh, but uh, higher um, center may also voluntarily initiate uh, the micturition reflex uh, as a seen with territorial marking behavior. Mm. Uh, here you can see uh, the illustration depicting the neural control of the urine storage. Uh, uh, the predominant, I'm always losing my cursor, excuse me, where is my cursor? Yeah, here, here it is. Uh, the predominant input is sympathetic with the hypogastric nerve uh, transmitting input to uh, beta adrenergic um, receptor in the bladder body and alpha adrenergic receptors in the bladder neck and urethra. Uh, 
uh, we can see facilitation of the pudendal nerve, uh, facilitation of the hypogastric nerve, um, and um, inhibition of the pelvic nerve. Uh, as a result, we have bladder relaxation and urethral constriction. Uh, the bladder is filling. Uh, here you can see uh, the neural control of urine voiding. Uh, the predominant input uh, is parasympathetic uh, with the uh, pelvic nerve uh, transmitting input to cholinergic receptors in the urinary bladder. So we can see inhibition of uh, inhibition of pudendal nerve and hypogastric nerve and facilitation of the pelvic nerve. As a, as a result, we have uh, bladder contraction and at the same time urethral uh, relaxation resulting in coordinate the evacuation of the urine from the bladder. It's, uh, if you're talking about the neurologic patients, uh, it's very important to, important, important to remember uh, that um, voluntary and adequate nutrition should always be verified. Uh, the presence of urine uh, in the patient's cage uh, doesn't necessarily mean the normal uh, nutrition. Uh, the patient uh, could have urinary overflow due to distension. We have to observe uh, the nutrition act and check the adequate emptying of the bladder by palpation uh, and or ultrasound. Uh, you have to understand uh, to, to estimate uh, the nutrition act, you have to understand the basic principle of bladder function and dysfunction. Uh, so now let's talk about the dysfunction. Uh, the main type of bladder dysfunction are upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron uh, dysfunction. Uh, the upper motor neuron bladder uh, encountered with when uh, lesions uh, are between the pons and the L7 segment of the spinal cord, most commonly T3, L3. Uh, patients uh, uh, is completely unable to unite or cannot effectively accomplish bladder emptying. Uh, the hallmark of uh, the upper motor neuron bladder is the increased tone. Uh, this phenomenon may be thought as uh, disinhibition of the spinal cord neuron uh, pulse involved in urination. Uh, the urethral musculature typically become hyperactive and the bladder fills with urine. Uh, upon palpation, uh, the bladder often fills Target and is uh, difficult or impossible to express uh, manually. Uh, sometimes uh, secondary overflow overflow incontinence when the bladder pressure exceeds the ureter the urethral pressure occurs. Uh, the lower motor neuron, neuron uh, bladder dysfunction uh, occurs uh, when the lesion uh, is. On, at the level of the cauda equina area or the pelvic olympusacral plexus within the pelvic canal, uh, most commonly traumatic. Um, uh, the lesion also this this lesions also attenuate or abolish the detrusor reflex, but in a different manner. Um, the hallmark of lower motor neuron bladder is the decreased tone. Both the detrusor and the urethral uh, musculature typically become flaccid in the patient constantly dribbles uh, urine. Uh, the bladder is often difficult to discern uh, as an isolated uh, structure uh, on palpation. And even slight abdominal pressure usually causes urine to be easily expressed. It is very difficult to tell by palpation, however, if the bladder has been adequately emptied. In some patients, uh, the unattenuated uh, efferent hypogastric uh, nerve activity provides enough uh, internal restral sphincter tone to make blood expression difficult. Uh, the 
urethral dysynergia is another disorder of micturition likely of neurogenic etiology. Uh, it's a micturition abnormality due to an abnormal coordination between the detrusor and the urethral sphincter muscles. Um, the, uh, the urethral muscle, muscles, uh, external urethral, urethral sphincter, contract abnormally during detrusor contraction, resulting in abnormal interruption of urination. Uh, the causes are not clearly understood. Sometimes um, it can be idiopathic, uh, especially in middle age, large breed male dogs. Okay, now you think that your patient has some bladder dysfunction. Uh, before expressing the bladder by any method, uh, it's advisable to first allow uh, the patient to try to urinate voluntarily. If the patient does voluntarily urinate, it's still necessary to palpate the bladder and uh, check uh, the residual volume uh, to ensure complete uh, ev evacuation. Um, uh, so there are different uh, techniques for the expression of the bladder. Uh, First is the manual expression. It's quite easy with lower motor neuron bladder, but difficult and uh, even contraindicated sometimes with upper motor neuron bladder. Uh, you have to check that the urethral sphincters are not contracted before the expression. Uh, it, uh, you need uh, the soft restraining and uh, external pressure. Uh, by fingers, not by fists, and stress should be minimized. Um, evacuation uh, of the bladder should never be forceful or aggressive. Uh, this technique uh, have, has some complication. For example, trauma of the bladder wall, uh, urinary tract inf uh, infection, uh, overflow incontinence, and urine scalding. Uh, the last three uh, usually occur uh, when you are not empty, you are not uh, completely emptying the bladder. So proper technique should be used and complete um, and complete evacuation should be achieved. The next one, uh, if the bladder can uh, the catheterization, uh, you, you, uh, you usually use uh, when the manual expression is impossible or even contraindicated. Uh, or uh, patient uh, is stressful a lot with the manual expression. Uh, intermittent catheterization uh, it, uh, is when you place a urinary catheter aseptically, uh, usually twice a day, uh, draining the bladder and then remove the catheter. Uh, it now um, accounted as the best technique uh, to use in, to minimize urinary tract infection if you use a proper use it properly and aseptically. It's more suitable for male dogs than for female, but sometimes female dogs are also easy to catheterize. Uh, it has some complication, of course, uh, tra trauma of urethral and bladder wall and urinary tract infection. Uh, but for this um, technique, it's minimal in compare with uh, all other techniques. Uh, the next technique is invalid catheterization. It used when the patient is recumbent, easily stressed, uh, or, or is going to require bladder management for several days. Um, you uh, should uh, put uh, the catheter and connect uh, it with a connection system it should be always a septic draining. It also has a complication uh, like the previous uh, technique uh, to tra trauma of the urethral and bladder walls, uh, urinary tract infection, and urine scalding. Uh, for that technique, um, urinary tract infection is the greatest uh, risk among all others. Um, 
uh, now we uh, uh, talk, uh, will talk about the pharmacological treatment. Uh, again, you always uh, give a chance to voluntarily urinate for the patients before any pharmacological uh, agents use. Um, uh, oh, uh, and uh, in addition, I ask you whenever you use uh, presentation, presentation like that or any other sources for the management of your patients, always check the dosage, uh, possible adverse effect, contraindications and drug inter uh, interactions and formularies and other sources. And uh, I will focus only on drugs most frequently used in uh, clinical neurological uh, practice. Um, it's, it is uh, important to distinguish between types of bladder dysfunction to get in mind which pharmacological agents uh, will be the best choice for improving uh, bladder function. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, have no time to discuss all the pharmacological agents in details, uh, but you can always uh, look through those tables later. And if you are interested in, uh, I can make a more detailed review of these drugs for the next the conference. Uh, first uh, group of drugs uh, is to increase the trouser contractility. Uh, and uh, as for the manual expression of the bladder, you should always be sure that the urethral sphincters are not contracted uh, before the use any of this drug. The second group uh, we use to decrease uh, detrusor contractility. It's usually anticholinergic. Um, the next uh, increase urethral resistance. And the last one to decrease urethral resistance. Uh, so uh, you can, therefore, you can use uh, the agent uh, from that group before manual expression or before. Uh, you, before using uh, the drug from the first group, if you have uh, the increased urethral tone, uh, it's the biggest, biggest, biggest group. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, you, sometimes any uh, any of the drug cannot help you with the bladder function. Uh, in that case, we have some alternative methods, for example, sacral nerve stimulation and acupuncture, but uh, they are not so often used and not have enough uh, evidences uh, and uh, not have enough data uh, for using dogs and cats. In conclusion, uh, I want to say that, uh, remind you that most neuro neurological patients require some degree of bladder management. Uh, proper technique and both expressing and catheterizing the bladder is important uh, to prevent uh, urethral and bladder wall trauma, to prevent introduction, introduction of bacteria into the urinary tract, and to measure urinary output in the oligorrhea and anuric patient as a guideline for appropriate fluid therapy. And uh, veterinarians should be aware of different types and techniques of bladder management, the indication, complication, and benefits in order to best meet the needs of uh, the client. So thank you for your attention. And if, if you have any question, I'm ready to answer it. Uh, Lydia, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was all very you know, clear and uh, very well organized. Uh, so thanks a lot. But yeah, if uh, next time you can talk uh, more about these uh, drugs, I think it will be great and everyone will appreciate that. Okay, so uh, I suppose nobody has questions now. Uh, so we can give uh, the word to our last speaker, Marina Kazimirchuk, who will talk about polypropylene meshes in rats. So Marina, you can start. Oh, Marina has some technical problems, just a moment. Today is the bad technology day for, for everyone. Uh, may I be in the world video? Uh, yes, Marina, if it works for you better than yes. I think it, it, uh, <laughs> it is better because I'm afraid to turn on video once I can. Uh, so I will start 
my presentation. Uh, do you see my presentation right now? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, should I try to show you a full screen mode or not? Uh, let's try without that. <laughs> okay. I don't know what is happening right now because uh, usually uh, everything works really well. Uh, so today I would like to speak about uh, uh, difficult surgeries in domestic rats. Uh, first of all, may maybe I should uh, speak uh, a little bit about myself. Maybe somebody don doesn't know me well, or maybe not. Uh, so my name is Marina, as Katerina has said. I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, I graduated from St. Petersburg State Academy 10 years ago. I'm really old. <laughs> um, and right now I'm working as an uh, exotic animal doctor. Uh, I work in two, uh, in two clinics. It's uh, Katana in St. Petersburg and Dr. Clinic, uh, Dr. Sotnikov Clinic. Um, most of my patients are small mammals. It's like rodents, rabbits, ferrets. And uh, sometimes I see birds and reptiles. And today I would like to speak about uh, oncological disease in uh, domestic rats and about difficult surgeries in them. Because sometimes uh, uh, people doesn't believe in these surgeries uh, because it is uh, not really cheap. It's, it is expensive, to be honest. Uh, and uh, it is... Uh, more difficult sometimes when in dogs and cats, but it is possible. Uh, and uh, uh, let me go back and uh, and uh, you can see this picture uh, because it's I, I like this picture really uh, because uh, here you can see uh, uh, the middle of uh, operation I will speak about today. Uh, so we remove uh, a tumor with the part of abdominal wall and thoracic wall. And here you can see uh, a liver, intestine, uh, a lung, and uh, uh, two lungs, to be honest. Uh, part of uh, chest wall with ribs. Uh, we, remove four rib, uh, we removed four ribs here. And uh, between uh, lung and uh, liver, uh, there is a diaphragm. Uh, do you see my, uh, my pointer? Yes. OK. So it, it is easy for me. <clears throat> and uh, uh, today uh, we are speaking about oncology and we should understand that uh, small mammal oncology is developing really fast. Uh, it's like uh, dogs, for dogs and cats, uh, but uh, um, maybe uh, one or two steps uh, back. <clears throat> uh, sometimes uh, anesthesia for some, uh, some uh, such procedures is really difficult. Uh, as we can see on this picture, we were opening uh, the chest cavity. Uh, so in this case, we should use uh, artificial lung ventilation because animal couldn't breathe without our help. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this surgery is really massive for animal. Uh, so it can be really difficult to remove all these tissues around. Uh, and uh, it also, it can be really difficult to close this defect because we removed a lot of tissue, so we need something to close it. Uh, when we speak about uh, thoracic wall of red uh, and tumors on it, so we can uh, imagine two different situations. The first one is uh, in the left image. Uh, it's a typical rat with mammary gland tumor. We know that rats have a lot of mammary glands and um, uh, uh, here we can see a uh, neoplasia of caudal thoracic mammary gland. <clears throat> and uh, this is a really simple operation. It uh, takes about seven minutes uh, from the beginning to the last suture. Uh, and the, it, it can be done really easy. And uh, on the, uh, in the left image, <laughs> you can see a difficult situation. Uh, this is uh, also red uh, with the tumor, but here we cannot see uh, the margins of this tumor, and we should understand that this tumor uh, is growing uh, through the thoracic and a little bit through the abdominal wall, and uh, some ribs are involved in this process. 
And uh, on this central image, in this central image, we can see a big tumor uh, with the same situation. And, uh, this is a part of the thoracic wall. This is a part of abdominal wall. This is a part of the diaphragm here. And uh, uh, ribs are also involved in the pathological process. And so if we need to remove this tumor, it's just one skin incision, uh, the bulking, and closing the wound. If we remove this tumor, we should uh, remove all the mass. We should remove some ribs, for example, in this case, one, two, three, four, maybe four. Uh, and when we have to do a diaphragm transposition, uh, or maybe use uh, some artificial materials to close the defect. Uh, 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 I don't like this uh, uh, not uh, full screen mode. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, the situation is like this. So, uh, so uh, this is a conclusion about uh, treating these two difficult situations. The first one is mammary gland tumors. Uh, we understand that most of these tumors are fibroadenomous. It's a benign tumor. Uh, and it is easy, easy to remove it. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult, of course. Uh, when the tumor is uh, uh, in the inguinal area and uh, it involves urethra, so we have to reconstruct uh, the uh, structures uh, of this uh, part of the body. Uh, and uh, when we speak about uh, soft tissue malignant tumors. We usually speak about fibrosarcomas or soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, this is a fast growing malignant tumors. We have, we usually uh, uh, aggressively invade all the tissues around. Uh, if we uh, do not remove these tumors completely, we will have uh, a, a very uh, fast relapse. Uh, but uh, it is possible to treat these patients. And uh, sometimes we see these patients. Also, of course, uh, mammary gland tumors is, uh, we can see really um, more often than uh, malignant tumors, but sometimes this patient just happen, patients just happen in our life. So we have to know how to help them. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, first of all, this, um, uh, tumors are really fast growing. So we should diagnose this patient, uh, patients and treat them as soon as possible. Uh, sometimes it is a problem. For example, for me, I, do, I usually do not have uh, freeze, uh, freeze loss for, for example, two weeks for or maybe one week. So uh, I don't have time and I have to go on my days off uh, to uh, see a computer tomography results and to uh, perform the operations, for example. Uh, so it's uh, sometimes uh, I don't like these situations, but uh, I don't know how to change it. And then I don't know how to stop the uh, process because uh, neoplasia lives uh, uh, without thinking about my life. <clears throat> uh, when we speak about uh, uh, preparing for surgery, it is really important to know two things, uh, how deep uh, the tumor uh, is inside the body and uh, what is the type of tumor. So for, to answer the first question, we perform a computer tomography with angiography. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, because something is changed. Uh, something changed. Okay, uh, if you hear me, that's okay. Uh, so we perform computer tomography and angiography. And uh, to answer the second question, we uh, used to perform cytology examination, but right now I do not uh, do this procedure because uh, it is uh, uh, our uh, future. Uh, uh, our um, um, planning of the operation will not depend on the results of the cytology. If we, we will have a, a malignant tumor, okay, we will uh, remove it like a malign malignant tumor. If we will uh, have zero results, uh, for example, um, not malignant cells, but uh, you need uh, to perform a histology, okay, I will remove this tumor as a malignant one and then perform a hist histology. So, okay, in all cases, I will 
uh, have, an, uh, have a surgery like a malignant tumor. So I don't need a cytology in these cases. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's not, uh, uh, it's not right uh, from the oncological point of view, uh, but from the point, uh, from the exotic mammal specialist, it's okay. Uh, so when we speak about anesthesia, you should have a really good anesthesiologist who loves small mammals, uh, because it's, it is impossible to perform these procedures without that kind of anesthesiologist. Uh, and uh, the main points are, we need a tracheal intubation, we need uh, the possibility of artifici artificial lung ventilation, and we have to uh, use uh, different painkillers for these animals because these procedures are really painful. Uh, uh, when uh, we should think about clear margins, uh, we are speaking about malignant tumors, so we can't uh, just uh, cut it out uh, without thinking uh, about the relapse. Uh, so uh, for dogs and cats, uh, uh, we usually speak about three to five centimeters of the uh, normal tissue around the tumor uh, we have to remove. But in rats, we don't have this information. And sometimes we lack a body surface area uh, to perform this five centimeters. If we will uh, cut off five, five centimeters uh, from four sides, not four, but six sides of the red, uh, all the red will be removed from this life. Uh, so uh, usually we try to make one centimeter clear margins, uh, or uh, we can use a rule like uh, uh, clear margins as wide as we can. And before, uh, before surgery, we should think about how to close with uh, thoracic or abdominal wall defect. Uh, sometimes you can do some plastics, some, uh, for example, diaphragm transposition and closing the wound with the soft tissue. Uh, and if the, for example, if the uh, tumor is uh, small, and uh, sometimes you cannot do it, so you have to use uh, uh, different materials, uh, including artificial materials, for example, polypropylene mesh. So, uh, in dogs and cats, in these operations, sometimes we use uh, plural drainages, uh, but in rats, in all cases, we have about 10 or 12 for today uh, cases of, uh, with these operations. Uh, uh, we do not, uh, we didn't use uh, plural drainages in all situations and everything went fine. <clears throat> and uh, uh, after the procedure, in all cases, uh, we uh, um, uh, took sam take samples for histological examination and we receive uh, the results usually in uh, two to three weeks. And after we, re uh, we receive these results, we sometimes start chemotherapy. Uh, we have some uh, 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 data from uh, conference proceedings about uh, treating uh, fibrosarcomas in rats with metronomic chemotherapy. So we try to use the same protocols. Uh, it's a big problem for us for today because uh, sometimes uh, we have to extrapolate uh, protocols from dogs and cats medicine. And uh, I think that it is not right because uh, they have a different rates of metabolism. <clears throat> And uh, like in our animals, we perform uh, control uh, in three months, and then in six months, and then in 12 months. Unfortunately, uh, most of our patients are older than uh, 24 months, two years. Uh, so we don't have one year, for example, uh, for leave, but uh, it's okay. Um, maybe we will uh, prolong their lives for, for example, six months, and it is really good for it. Uh, so, a little bit about anesthesia. Uh, first of all, uh, tracheal intubation is possible in rats, and it is really easier when in uh, guinea pigs and chinchillas. And uh, sometimes it is easier when in rabbits, even in rabbits, because uh, sometimes we can uh, uh, directly visualize uh, the larynx uh, when we open the mouth of red. Uh, sometimes we use transillumination technique like in kittens. Uh, we um, use a, a lamp, like a, a lamp uh, for tourists. Uh, and we 
put it uh, on the ventral neck of the red, and when the red, uh, when the vocal cords are opening, uh, we can see a spot of light, and we uh, introduce the tube uh, on this spot. And uh, of course, we can use endoscopic associated uh, intubation like in our rodents. Uh, uh, reds are small and uh, usually 2.0 uh, in the tracheal tube tubes are big uh, are big when are bigger when we uh, should use uh, for these patients so we make uh, into, uh, endotracheal tubes from him by our own so we just can take uh, IV catheter uh, with different diameters for example for reds we usually use uh, the <clears throat> green one, the gray one, uh, or the yellow one. And uh, we can use the top part of the uh, ordinary endotracheal tube. Uh, it is easily removed from this tube. And then we can uh, take it to our IV catheter. And so we have the uh, special design endotracheal tube for it. <clears throat> we usually uh, perform induction to anesthesia with uh, the isoflurane. Uh, in box. Uh, when uh, the animal is sleeping, uh, we uh, put an IV catheter. Uh, the most popular place uh, for IV catheters in reds is the lateral tail veins. We have uh, two veins uh, on each uh, lateral side of the tail. And sometimes uh, we use uh, lateral saphenous vein, uh, like in dogs. Uh, uh, we perform analgesia. Uh, with uh, ketamine, lidocaine, and fentanyl uh, with concentrate infusion. Uh, they tolerant, uh, tolerate the, these uh, drugs really well. Uh, I, do, uh, I, I do not do uh, like lidocaine blocks of the ribs like in dogs uh, in small reds, but maybe uh, in some days I will start to perform these procedures. Uh, so after the procedure, uh, we uh, usually use uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for about two weeks and antibiotics if we need them. So here we can, you can see the uh, different steps of the malignant tumor removal in red. Uh, in the top left image, you can see the tumor. Uh, the soft tissue around this tumor. And here you can see, uh, I think the lung, I think the lung and uh, maybe part of stomach. Uh, on the next image, uh, you can see the diaphragm, uh, thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity. Uh, when, uh, <coughs> uh, so we decided to use the artificial mesh uh, to uh, close the defect. Uh, we use a uh, Mm, special meshes for hernioplasty uh, in humans, dogs, and cats. Uh, they worked really well for these uh, 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 surgeries. And when we close the wound uh, with, uh, with soft tissues. Uh, in rats, we usually use intradermal suture because we do not tolerate really well uh, the e collars and uh, uh, special bandages. Uh, even we have a we have an article about laboratory red, uh, uh, which uh, had a, a bilateral uh, te temporomandibular sub uh, joint subluxation. Uh, yeah, and she received this condition uh, uh, during uh, her attempts uh, to remove bandages bandage from her body. Uh, so I don't like bandages at all. Uh, of course, when we close in the wound, uh, we should uh, remove uh, free air from a thoracic cavity uh, because uh, if we uh, will not do it, uh, the rat uh, will not have a chance to uh, breathe on, he on, on her own, on his own. <clears throat> uh, so we just use a butterfly catheter. Uh, and uh, we remove air like we do it in cats with pneumothorax. Uh, and uh, on the last 
with the last suture, we remove the this tube. And sometimes I just uh, close the thoracic cavity and then use an, uh, a small syringe with small needle and just uh, aspirate the air from the uh, cavity. Of course, after, after um, any operation, we can have complications. Uh, we have a lot of different complications with these patients. Uh, for example, on this image, you can see a seroma formation. Uh, this is a different rate. It's not uh, uh, the, the one with all the possible complications. It's uh, four different patients. Uh, so the next uh, interesting rate uh, is a rate with uh, distal tail necrosis. Uh, so we have an IV catheter. It was in yellow one uh, here. And uh, this catheter uh, was in red uh, for three days, I think. And after that, they have, we, um, uh, this animal had a distal tail necrosis, and we have to um, we had to amputate this tail. Uh, this is a red with uh, uh, regrowing of the tumor, uh, but uh, to be honest, it was uh, my operation, not uh, for. It was performed by myself, not by our plastic surgeon, for example, and it was uh, the first one. Uh, so uh, we just, I just uh, didn't uh, took all the tumor because I was afraid because I saw lungs and I, I was not uh, sure about anesthesiology, uh, anesthesiology in this moment. Uh, so we just close the wound and uh, we have a regrowing of the tumor and this red was euthanized uh, in three months, I think, after the operation. And uh, uh, in this thread, it's uh, the fourth case. Uh, we started metronomic chemotherapy with uh, cyclophosphamide and uh, tosaranib for uh, the next day after the operation. So we have a prolonged wound healing. Uh, in the, it, it is... Um, uh, not really important for us because we can control the inflammation, everything is okay, uh, but uh, it takes about three, it took about three or four uh, weeks uh, to uh, heal completely. And for human patients, uh, the big problem is adhesion formation, uh, both for thoracic cavity and for abdominal cavity. Uh, I don't think that for thoracic cavity it will be a big problem for it uh, because uh, we live, uh, we have a lot of patients that live uh, with uh, adhesions inside the chest cavity just because of respiratory syndrome and uh, everything is okay. Uh, it, it's not a healthy, of course, it is not a healthy condition, but uh, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe we can uh, let this adhesion to form it. It's no, it's okay. <clears throat> uh, so uh, for today, I did not find any information about uh, this kind of uh, uh, surgeries in rats. Uh, but we have some biological data because rats are really good laboratory animals. So sometimes we can use this uh, uh, data for our real patients. And we use the same surgical techniques uh, as we use in dogs and cats. For example, you can uh, read in book how to uh, reconstruct uh, chest wall uh, in dogs after the tumor removal and do the same in red. But uh, you should think about the red is a legally small one. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the interesting thing for me is to uh, discuss uh, uh, meshes that we use for the closing and the defects. Uh, so we can uh, have a lot, uh, we have a lot of uh, different variations of these meshes. And uh, some of them are adsorbable, some of them are, some of them are not adsorbable. And uh, some of them we have a special coating to prevent adhesions, uh, some of them not. Uh, we use this mesh when we, uh, we lack a soft tissue to close the wound, or we have to reconstruct uh, the carcass of the uh, chest wall or abdominal wall. And uh, uh, we should understand that uh, when we suture up uh, the mesh uh, into the body, uh, it, is also, it is always a foreign body, so 
uh, the organism of red will react in different ways, uh, including acute inflammation in fibroplasia. And uh, after the fib fibroplasia, it's like a scar formation. So after that, we will have a scar here. And I would like to show you the materials of uh, exotic scone. Uh, I think that it was in 2018. It's uh, the biggest American conference in exotic pet medicine. And they have uh, a presentation about using a metronomic chemotherapy in pet rat with fib fiber sarcoma. Uh, so uh, they uh, used cyclo cyclophosphamide and uh, uh, to Saranip, uh, and when they changed uh, it to metformin and uh, etoposide. <clears throat> oh, etoposide. Uh, I tried to, to use the same, uh, the same protocol, but uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, maybe it is uh, better to use a smaller doses of cyclophosphamide because in all cases when, when we use it, we have a really we have a really severe. Uh, leukopenia after uh, 10 to 15 days of starting this chemotherapy. Uh, that's why I, right now I start, I tried to use uh, about uh, uh, 20 to 50 uh, milligram uh, per uh, uh, quadrant meter, meter, quadrant meter, not 20 milligram per kilogram. And uh, tesseranib, uh, it is very expensive uh, drug, but uh, rats uh, are tolerated it very, very well. <clears throat> and when we speak about chemotherapy in rats, it's an, an interesting subject to discuss uh, for today. Uh, we should remember that rat is, is a normal patient. So uh, if we have to you know, control, uh, for example, uh, complete blood count, we have to do it. Uh, not think about, uh, uh, do not think that red is small one and uh, it is expensive procedure to maybe to take blood uh, every every week. No, it's okay. And uh, the owners of red uh, usually uh, try to treat them as good as we can advise them. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, at the end of this presentation, I would notice that uh, uh, treating of invasive tumors are possible in rats, uh, even if we think that it is difficult surgeries. Yes, they are difficult, but we, it is possible. Uh, we have about 10 cases of using polypropylene meshes, and uh, in all cases, they were well tolerated. Uh, when we speak about treating a patient with malignant tumors, we should think not uh, only about surgery, uh, but uh, about chemotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, in these patients, radiation therapy is not really important for us because the sarcomas are usually not really sensitive to radiation. And uh, we need more clinical cases and uh, um, the analysis, analysis of the results of the treatment uh, to say that, uh, yes, it is possible or not and how to do it better. Uh, but right now, I must say that it is possible, but I don't know if uh, we have to do it in all cases or not. Uh, so if you have any questions, I would like to, I, I, was, I will be really happy to answer. And also, I would like to thank uh, my team, uh, because uh, it is impossible to treat uh, such kind of patients uh, all along. Uh, all along. Uh, so... Uh, uh, two main uh, persons which helps me, which helped me in treating these rats. It's our plastic surgeon Ksenia Lavrova and our anesthesiologist Vera Sitko. And also, I would like to thank Katerina uh, for the organization of these conferences because uh, it was some kind of uh, psychological issue for me. I think because uh, I was thinking that I have to, uh, uh, that I have to sent abstract to uh, international conferences, but I'm afraid I can't speak English. So, and uh, it was, uh, uh, and I was thinking about this for many months or maybe or even years. And uh, after our first conferences of uh, conference, when I was speaking English uh, on, 
on I uh, uh, just uh, sent my abstract and uh, I received an approval and I'm really happy about this. So thank you. Uh, Marina, uh, thank you very much. Uh, honestly, it's it's great to hear that your English is fantastic and I'm sure that your conference in Hungary will be a great success. Uh, thank you very much. And I actually have one question. So do owners often want to treat rats? Uh, I am a reference specialist. So yes, when they came to me, they want to treat rats. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Right, and so um, uh -huh. uh, Natalia says, uh, thanks to all the lecturers. It was difficult for me, but very interesting. Natalia, thank you for coming. But this is not all. Uh, we have uh, one uh, thing left. So uh, as I said before, uh, we have some prizes uh, for everyone who registered for the conference. Uh, so now we're going to uh, see who wins. And uh, there are uh, three types of prizes. Uh, one person will get a private uh, lesson with a native speaker, with Tony Weber. And um, eight other people uh, will get a speaking club or a um, participation in a medical English lesson. So uh, now let's see who gets a, oops, a lesson with a native speaker. So can you see my screen? Uh, if you can see it, please uh, write something in the chat. I will be very grateful. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Natalia. Right, so. It's nearly there, I think. Ah, it's taking <laughs> uh, too long when you're sharing screen on Zoom. So uh, by the looks of it, it's Ivan Makarov. Uh, so Ivan, I will contact you after uh, this conference um, to discuss uh, this uh, lesson. And <laughs> yeah, leader wrote suspense. <laughs> Yes, that's it. Okay, and uh, for everyone else, uh, I will uh, message you and I will ask uh, which you would prefer, a speaking club or a medical English lesson, and then we will discuss the details. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it was great to see you. And uh, thanks uh, to the presenters for the lectures. Thanks to the participants for uh, the questions and for the attention. So I hope you enjoyed it. Have a very nice evening and uh, goodbye.